Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to our session today, uh, our Cockroach Hour live stream. We're going to be talking CAP Theorem today. Uh, should be a good discussion. I'm really looking forward to it. We're going to give everybody one more minute to make sure they're available <laughs> uh, for the webinar, uh, but we will be consistent in our approach. Thank you, everybody. We'll be, we'll be right back. Uh, just another minute before we get started. Everybody, thanks for joining. We will start in just a minute. Thank you. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you're at on this big blue planet. Um, we are excited for today for um, part one of a three-part series. We're going to talk about CAP theorem. Uh, CAP theorem is something that comes up often uh, in our conversations, both internally and externally. And kind of one of these key concepts that I feel is really important to understanding distributed systems and really kind of the way that this kind of distributed and this whole move towards distributed thinking is, is going. Uh, in part one today, we're going to focus on consistency. So, uh, so let's get into it. So, a bit of housekeeping first. Um, please do ask questions in in our QA panel. Um, engage us in chat. We love that. Uh, we've got a couple people on the line. My friends Michael and uh, Jim too. Oh, come on, Jim Hatcher. I love you, buddy. Uh, are both on the chat and ready to engage with everybody uh, as you have questions. Um, at the end of the webinar, we will definitely conduct a survey. Um, this is the first time we've done something a bit more academic, so we would love feedback in terms of how valuable this was or how we can improve. It'd be great. And then a recording of this and all of our webinars are up uh, typically with pretty quickly after the event. I don't want to give an SLA here, but typically on our YouTube channel, um, they're up and ready and, and available to everybody. And, you know, we'll send follow up uh, to the session itself. Um, you know, it'll be a follow-up email. I have a lot of links this time around in this, in this session. Um, we're going to give it a little bit of history. And I think there's some really great reads out there. Uh, if you're interested, we'll, we'll send links to all that stuff and links to the slides and, uh, you know, all the, all the material um, after the event, uh, including the recording. So, um, so again, thank you for getting started. So my name is Jim. I am in product marketing here at Cockroach Labs. Been in the company about two and a half years. Um, I don't typically talk about this in my introduction, but I am, uh, I'm an ex engineer. I coded for a while, uh, and I'm an electrical engineering computer science, uh, undergrad. I focus computer engineering, but that's a long time ago. And I only say that because this is kind of some academic stuff we're going to get into today. So I'm, I'm putting that caveat out there before we, we start. And then on Twitter, of course, I, I'm James J A Y M C E if you want to follow. And then I'm joined by Tim. Are you here? I am here. Awesome. Hello, Jim. With your flowing hair, I'm so happy. Yeah, awesome. it's here. Well, I am joined by my friend, Tim Vale, who I've known for quite some time now. And, um, you know, Tim does a lot of work with our customers and helping them be successful with, you know, their shift to microservices and distributed systems and, you know, the role of data in, in, in that transition. So, and then Tim, you, you're a finance undergrad, but you, you had some IS, right? I did. I dual majored, strangely, uh, MIS and finance uh, at University of Georgia, and then went straight into engineering roles and spent most of my career doing engineering until relatively recently. So, yeah. 
Well, and yeah, you, this is a tough topic. You know, this uh, <laughs> we better set the expectation really low for you. For you oh not. my this god, is a tough it, one. You know, uh, set the expectations low. Uh, you know, you you still code a whole heck of a lot more than me. I don't code anymore. I actually love these no code platforms because I could actually do anyway, regardless. So. Um, you know, we typically get asked, you know, what is this session about? This is uh, an intermediate session. So we aren't going to get really deep into the weeds of the code itself. If you want to actually go check out how we implement these things, you know, the Cockroach DB um, code base is absolutely all, all, all open and available to people. So you can really get into it. Um, again, I'm not an expert. I'm curious and I love tech. I love getting into algorithms, this sort of stuff. Um, but I do believe that this is the kind of stuff that careers are made of. Understanding cap theorem, understanding raft, understanding MVCC, even if you don't code it, understanding these principles, I think is the stuff that's changed the world over the past couple of years. And when I say change the world, I'm not talking about just tech and the stuff we're all building. I'm talking about how we interact with each other. Uh, there's been a sociological effect of these, these core concepts. And, and I'm going to get a little bit into the history here because I feel that you know the people that have actually come up with this stuff need to be um, put on a pedestal almost. I, I think it's truly amazing stuff that that has been done in the world of, of, of compute over the last couple of years. So so today, this is really kind of a high level context of, of these important concepts. So Tim, I invite you to please jump in wherever you like, uh, you know, and, and provide comment. You're like the, the color commentary guy. I'm, I'm the play by play, I guess, right? It's baseball season, y'all. My white socks are doing well, obviously. So, okay. So before we get to the end, let's just start at the beginning. And, you know, I, I look at the course of my career and I look at the course of things that have been created in, in companies and groups and research centers that have made a fundamental impact on our lives and what we do as, as people. And I've got to reach all the way back to Fairchild Semiconductor because I think that was one of the very first kind of innovative companies in terms of the, really the, the computer industry started there in the, in the Valley at least, right? And there was this treacherous eight you'll hear of. And the treacherous eight were these eight guys that had left Fairchild and created Intel. What's Intel but the entire, you know, future of, of compute for how many years now, right? The second was uh, the Park Research Center, the Palo Alto Research Center at Xerox. And, and, you know, again, if you're not familiar with it, being a student of history is actually pretty important. Some of the things that came out of here was the, the mouse, um, the graphical user interface, um, the language that they actually came up with was this, this thing called small talk, which was object oriented, um, which has really defined massive, huge parts of what we are. Apple would not be Apple without Park uh, Research Center and, and, and everything that happened there. Uh, Microsoft Windows, um, the, the, the next computer that Steve Jobs did after he left uh, uh, Apple and started his own company, it was direct output of all of the stuff that was happening there. And that was really the, the genesis of, I mean, the, the MacBook I'm sitting here working off of right now. And then, you know, I think digital and DEC had a, a significant play in all of this as well. If you look at the risk architecture of, you know, of compute and, and everything that's happened there in terms of, you know, pipelining of transactions. And I mean, the, 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 everything that we're doing at, at, at really the, the microchip level of CPU and, and what happened there in, in really the, the, the 80s and then into the 90s as well. Um, the DEC Research Center was just a huge, huge input. I bring that up because, you know, DEC was, was bought by Compaq in the mid-90s, I think, and then Compaq by HP a little bit later. But as DEC went into Compaq, there was confusion. And I think that Research Center kind of blew up. And a lot of the people that were at DEC went to this new company called Google. Uh, and, and if you look at Google at, you know, 1999, 2000, and, and the people that were there, uh, it's a who's who in terms of research of what's happened. Now, I bring up The Soul of a New Machine by Tracy Kidder because it was D Data General versus DEC. If you haven't read that book and you are a, a study of history of compute, of, of computers, uh, that is a really, really good read. I would go check. I read that a really long time. I don't know if people have read that or not. Tim, do you ever read that? I have not, but uh, I just added it to my reading list. So Yeah, it's, it's really, it's, it's not the most exciting book. But I got to tell you, as a, as a study of these things, I think it's important. But I, I bring this up because if you look at kind of major kind of moments in time in terms of research or what's happened at particular companies, I, I leave this with Google. And if you're not familiar with the two people that are in photographs here, um, Jeff Dean and Sanjay Gamawad, if, if you are not familiar with who they are, you should be. 
And I think every person should be. These are the under like represented masters of everything that we do right now. If you look at research within Google that's happened over the past 20 years, right? MapReduce. MapReduce written by Jeff Dean, um, the white paper. I don't know, Tim, you were at a company, a little company called uh, Hortonworks with me, weren't you? Right? Yeah, it brings a lot of memories. Right. And think how many different places the, the white paper that Google published with MapReduce has gone and fueled. Inktomi, the, the predecessor of this. I'll come back to them. Um, and then Bigtable. Bigtable started the NoSQL movement. I mean, you could take all of the principles that are lined out there and say, okay, that's NoSQL. Uh, the Google file system, if you look at you know, these huge, massive file systems at different companies around the planet, you know, those are all the kind of core concepts that we're looking at in terms of distributed storage. I bring up Spanner and TensorFlow because these two are still doing this today. They're still basically in the middle of all this, this innovation. Spanner, I mean, I, you know, I'm here at Cockroach Labs, y'all, and we took the, the Spanner white paper and we're building a database based off a lot of those core principles. And it just wouldn't have happened without these two people, period. Uh, maybe somebody else would have come along, but these are these are geniuses, and I, I think they should be. I don't know about idolized, but I tell you what, they, they you should know who they are, and and that's my little advertisement for these two guys. And I, I bring this up because, again, Google has kind of defined infrastructure for all of us now. I think it, you ever, I don't know if you ever heard of the term Giphy, Google infrastructure for everyone else. It was something that was coined by I don't know if it was Brandon Phillips or Alex Polvi at CoreOS, but um, but it's that's kind of what's happening. Right. And, and, and so we see all these, this innovation happening um, now. Oh, by the way, if you want to actually have a good read, a really quick flip through a couple slides, there's the QR code. Jeff Dean um, did this, I think it was like 2001 or something, um, but building large scale internet services. Uh, I flipped through it and I was like, Ooh, I love that thing. It, but what a, what a vision of the future this person has. Right. So I think Jeff is just truly phenomenal. I've never met him. I would love to actually. Okay. Side note about my sponsor about our sponsor for this, my employer, Spencer, Peter, and Ben. That's Peter, Spencer, and Ben in order there. Uh, they're actually employees very early at Google. Uh, their employees are in the mid 300s. They all joined within a couple months of each other. Uh, Spencer and Peter actually worked on Colossus, which was the next generation of Google file system. They basically saw Big Table get built out, Megastore, Spanner. Uh, ben was off building Reader that used all this stuff uh, and they've actually come together. And th th these are the founders of Cockroach. And I, I actually say this because I think a lot of the infrastructure tech and a lot of the stuff that's happening is as we transform our systems today really has been developed and, and researched out of, out of Google. And, you know, I'm proud to work for these guys because they're, they're brilliant. And I, and I, I'm really proud of the architecture we have. We're not going to talk about our architecture today though, a little bit, but so, okay. Cap theorem, Jim, let's get back to where we're at. Right. So, Actually, the cap theorem should be called Brewer's theorem, and it is called that. Um, uh, it was it was actually penned by a guy by the name of Eric Brewer. Eric Brewer is still a VP of Infrastructure, infrastructure and Google Fellow at uh, uh, at Google. Uh, he's uh, I believe he's a professor emeritus at UC Berkeley, um, and then he was founder of a little company called Inktomi. Uh, and if anybody is familiar with Inktomi in the early two thousands, good God for search, Inktomi just revolutionized everything. Again, Eric, remember, I mean, Tim, you remember our buddy, uh, Eric Balchweiler? Mm. Yeah. So Eric Balchweiler, I believe, worked for Eric Brewer wow. at Inktomi. And I don't know about you, but Balchweiler is one of the most brilliant engineering leaders I I've ever seen. And he was a founder at Hortonworks. So um, so there's just a lot of kind of like this this lineage. Now, I, I, I have this other picture here because this is, you know, Clinton with, with Brewer here. So I, I think Brewer kind of invented modern infrastructure. And funny enough, the vice president for Clinton invented the Internet, which is um, also. Oh, thank you Tim, for getting it. All right. Uh, yeah. And actually in the chat, y'all. Uh, yeah. So Jeff, uh, so Jeff Dean is actually pretty active on Twitter. He responds to people. Uh, he, he's, he's, like I said, he's just a solid human. And, um, like, yeah, somebody said they got questions answered when somebody was asking him about MapReduce, the guy's still engaged. It's it, it just, yeah, these are, these are great humans. So, and Eric, I think should be also, uh, uh put up there too. Um, if, if you look at the Brewer's theorem, um, he really first penned it. It's first of it, first appearance of it came about 1998. Now, there was a discussion there around this thing called acid versus base. Now, oh my God, like uh, transactional database people freaked out on this thing called base. 
Base stood for something called basic availability, soft state, and eventually consistent. Sounds a little no y to me. Um, you know, and I think it was like, it was the beginning of thinking of like, how do we relax some of these acid kind of, you know, thick restrictions that we have. And I think there was a, there was a lot of debate around this. And so the, the concepts kind of first appeared in 1998. Now in 1999, um, Eric published this, uh, I think they called it the cap principle. In 2000, um, at the principles of distributed computing uh, conference, which the PODC, uh, he presented this at 8.30 in the morning, July 19th. And he, it's towards robust distributed systems, my favorite word, robust. Uh, and, and I think that was the moment in time where I think anybody who's in modern infrastructure, everything changed. Um, I, I, I would look to that date and time, honestly. And then this, this thing was proved as a theorem by two people at MIT, Seth Gilbert and Nancy Lynch. So it became a theorem at that point. So the CAP theorem has been with us to 2002. If you want to get into the deep, like proving of this thing as a theorem, there's, there's lots of stuff out there. I, I would, if you enjoy that sort of thing, please go out there and do it. So, so in 2011, so this is well before Eric now is, he's at Tommy, he's a professor, he's doing all this really cool distributed system stuff. Um, and then in 2011, Eric joins Google and Wired writes this article, meet the man who's rewiring Google from the inside out. Um, and, you know, Eric joined Jeff Dean and Sanjay Gernawat at Google. And actually in this article, he even talks about his desk was about 10 feet away from them. So now you have these amazing minds all coming together to say, what's the next generation of infrastructure that's actually really going to deliver on massive, huge transformation of what was already probably years and years ahead of its time. And so this is just fuel on the fire. Um, I mean, he's, he, his, his design leadership, his, his input, he wasn't the only person I rewired. He, and he's, he's humble enough to say in the article, it's like, there was a whole bunch of people. Uh, and so I think that's a, a kind of a, another kind of instrumental moment in time. Again, you guys, I, I like history. I, li I like the history of these things. So, um, so Eric is just, again, a, a, a Google scholar. If you go check out his page, if you want to learn a whole lot about distributed systems, go check out his page, the Jeff Dean stuff, the, like literally all three of them, read their research. If you want a PhD in distributed systems, just read this stuff. It's, it's pretty phenomenal. And, and kudos to Google for making it accessible and easy for all, us to get to. Um, but hey, y'all like uh, Borg, Omega, uh, this little thing we call Kubernetes. Uh, yeah, look whose names are on those, on those, those articles that are, that are penned in... Um, in, 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 I think it's a, it's a Google publications you could look through too. Um, but it's, these three, those three names are all over the place. So, all right. So, sorry, yes, it was a lot of history, but I like history and, and thank you for sticking with me. I hope it's valuable. All right. So cap theorem. basically it says it's impossible for a distributed data store to simultaneously provide more than two of the three following guarantees, consistency, the C availability, the A and partition tolerance, the P now, let me get into what each of those is, okay? And so, um, and like I said, today we're going to cover consistency. We'll drill down on this one. So basically consistency means, look at, if I have a distributed store, which is kind of this green circle that's encompassing these two, these two stores, and I have two requests happening uh, across these two pieces of the system, the response that I'm going to get from those two is exactly the same, right? So if I select star from customers, I'm getting two records the data is all exactly correct. So the same data is gonna be returned and it's gonna be consistent everywhere, okay? Principle or guarantee number one, right? Now, availability is different, right? So basically what we're saying with availability is if I ask any one of these systems, I'm going to get a response, right? Basically that data, the data set, like the complete, like all the customer records, the order records, everything is gonna be available. It's, I'm not gonna have like two versions of the data set in these two things. I'm going to have the, the data is going to be available everywhere. Now, I have a slightly different little color here in this arrow because eh, it may not be consistent, right? Sometimes. And, and that's the trade-offs of, of this cap theorem. And we're going to get into that a little bit in, in a second. And then there's this thing called partition tolerant. Now, partition tolerance it's, it's special. It's okay. I think there's consistency and availability and then partition tolerant. We'll talk about that, but basically it's saying that if, if the nodes are disconnected, the system will continue to operate basically. So, so if I can partition off things and the system's still going to work, right. I don't, I don't have this kind of like offline node and it's making the whole thing fail, right? Like the, the it's got to work. Right. So 
Again, the CAP theorem says it's impossible for a distributed data store to simultaneously provide two of these three guarantees. So if we were to say, okay, let's do the combinations here, a CA database, it's consistent and available. Well, if you're consistent and available, you're basically not distributed, right? Like, like without partition tolerance, you're invalidating the entire concept of being distributed. In fact, the, the partition tolerant is at the very soul of the concept of being distributed. And so we wouldn't really talk about a CA database. A CA database is Postgres, it's MySQL. It's, it's a single database on a, a single server that, well, yeah, it's gonna be available, it's gonna be consistent. And there is no partition, partitions to deal with, right? There's no like separate nodes of this thing, right? So that's ultimately kind of what a CA database is, right? So if you remove out this partition thing, it's kind of our traditional databases. That, that's the way like, Tim, would you agree? I, I would, I mean, I think, you know, generally, you're either CP or AP. I mean, CA is, is, I mean, yeah, sure. You can draw a circle around those two, but as you, as you rightly pointed out, you've kind of invalidated the whole thing at that point, you're no longer really distributed. That's um, right. So yeah, I, I, I think, I think it's really about, about choosing consistency or availability. And that's what we'll talk about. And that's right. And that's right. And so, so typically when we get in these conversations about AP or CP and it's, you know, it's you're, you're available and partition tolerant, basically you'll have access to the same data set, with no guarantee, but no guarantee that every response will say, receive the same answer. So this is kind of like that eventually consistent thing. If you think about it in the, the old you know, acid way, it's like, you know, we get dirty reads or phantom reads or this sort of stuff. Like there's, there's inconsistencies in the, the physical, like the, the, the rows, the data, the columns, right? Um, that might actually happen. This is kind of like a NoSQL database typically has this type of level of, 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 of isolation, that sort of thing. Uh, and then there's consistent and partition tolerant. And Cockroach actually is a, is a CP database. Um, we're guarantee that, that every request will receive the same response. Now, we're going to suffer a little bit in availability. And we're going to talk about availability in the context of Cockroach in part two of this series. It's just way too much to talk about uh, in, one, in one session. But Tim, do you want to, I mean, you, I know you have a lot of conversations about this. Do you want to explain that or? Yeah, I, I think I can. Although I just noticed there's a there's an error on your uh, your screen here. It's oh, it's dude. consistent in partition tolerance. Oh, I, yeah. Oops, sorry. Yeah, gee whiz, Jim. Um, yeah, so I I think this is is really important, and I think what what you know ultimately you're saying here is in the face of um, a, a network partition, or, or sometimes we more generally think of it, it's just a failure, right? Yep. What is it that I want to maintain? Do I wanna maintain availability, always be able to serve reads and writes or requests? Or do I wanna main consistent, uh, maintain consistency? And sometimes we use the word correctness in place of consistency. You know, yep. What's more important ultimately to me, the ability to serve reads and writes in the face of failure, or to sacrifice availability and provide consistent or correct data once the system is back online. And, and you know, there are different reasons why you may choose either. It's important to know the difference between those two. And I think as you'll, as, as you'll hear Cockroach is, is erring on the side of, we would rather sacrifice availability. We talk about a lot about what that means, of course, in order to guarantee consistency or correctness. It's just a choice we have made. We think it's the right one, uh, but there are other flavors of this it, as any, constraint triangle will show you, you can always, you can pick two and you may not choose to pick the same ones we have chosen, but that's how we view the world. Well, I think it's, um, you know, I think there's our choice too, Tim, but ultimately it's your choice as the person who's choosing a workload. Like what is most important to you uh, in, in terms of what you want to accomplish? And I think to me, that's where understanding cap theorem and understanding this principle is important because it helps you understand what does this mean for your workload? Ask the questions of your workload and what you want to accomplish and choose the right tool. And, and understanding these concepts, I feel helps people get a better grasp of like, because look, there, there's the right tool for everything, right, Tim? I mean, you know, it's that's what it comes back to. Yeah, you know, and, and I think to that end, and we get this question a lot in the field, right? Well, which one are you? You know, what do you, what do you think? Right. What's cockroach? What's all this other stuff? And I think it helps people, not everybody understands these concepts, nor does everybody care. But I think for a lot of folks, it helps put different systems on the map. You know, distributed systems, as you kind of highlighted, are becoming uh, incredibly more prominent and prevalent and popular than they ever have before. And so these kinds of concepts are increasingly important in understanding how your systems are going to work or you should expect them to work. And so I think understanding the cap theorem, understanding ultimately the trade-offs that are here are really important to understand what you're getting, what you're giving up when making decisions about 
um, how you're going to store your data, the kinds of technologies you're choosing. And understanding these options really does become quite important. That's right, Tim. Yeah. Thank you, buddy. That, that's a really good kind of a description too. I, you know, it, again, I, I, I just, like I said at the very beginning, I think understanding these concepts just helps you understand distributed systems. Like this is the stuff that helped me really start to get it. And it was the partition tolerant thing that I think I struggled with most, honestly, because, um, you know, the physical nature of data in a distributed system matters uh, from an availability point of yes. view, from a consistent, more importantly, latency and how quick you can get to it. And, I, and, and we'll talk about that um, in subsequent um, sessions. Again, we'll talk about availability and then a lot in the partition tolerance uh, session, the part three will be a little bit more about um, uh, you know, latency and that sort of stuff. Mm. So, okay. All right. So, um, I, Tim, what is, uh, you know, I, somebody, somebody asked this, but what is Cassandra? Is Cassandra AP or CP? It is. So, you know, in my understanding, I'm, I'm not a Cassandra expert, although I, I do believe we, we have, have some one, on the line. Uh, on Maybe he can answer me answering this in chat. But, um, you know, I, my understanding is that by default, uh, Cassandra is an AP system. So okay. they will gladly sacrifice consistency by default yeah. in favor of availability. Um, I, I believe that is tunable uh, to some extent. Um, I don't know how often that is, is tuned, but I do believe there are options there. But by default, my understanding is Cassandra is an AP system. And, and oftentimes, quite honestly, this is what we face when we talk about Cassandra, customers coming to us, you know, having Cassandra operating in an AP system or in, in an AP fashion uh, and, and, and looking at ways to, to change that. Yeah. And I, we have the same kind of conversation too around tunability of the availability for us too. Right. Like I, you know, I think, I think when, I think, well, I guess what I, the reason I asked him is, is like, you aren't just basically sacrificing availability. It's just that you're, you're optimizing towards consistency. Right. And I think that's the trick here. So when you choose the right tool, again, it, it's like, I think, yeah. So thank you. Somebody actually said in the chat, they say Cassandra is tunable consistency, but by default is AP. And mm -hmm. I think that's a really good way. Like a cockroach is, is, is tunable availability, but default it's CP. Is that, is that a fair kind of statement, Tim? I, I think so. And, you know, I, I know having, having looked at your slides, we don't spend a lot of time kind of going into the, the weeds about some of the details here. And so I won't, but um, you know, I think one of the things to understand about cockroach is we talk about availability. I think people tend to think of it in, in maybe a, a global sense, but the reality is there's kind of a, a much smaller unit of measure here in cockroach. Right. Um, and so when we talk about availability, oftentimes we're talking about it, not at like this global sense, but really it's something we call the range. You know, a range may be unavailable. That doesn't mean the entire system is. Yeah. Um, and I think that's kind of an important distinction um, that, that maybe is beyond the scope of this particular talk, but one kind of understanding the, the fundamental framework of, of how cockroach is constructed and operates helps kind of, it, it makes a little bit more sense when we start to talk yep. about with those in, in conjunction with cap theorem. Yeah, and I think giving you context is good. And we'll talk a little bit, again, uh, series two or part two of the series, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about availability and what that means uh, basically within us, but in, in larger systems, which I think, again, applying these distributed concepts uh, really critical to your own understanding. So implementing consistency in a database. Now, again, because I, I will dive into a little bit that we do at Cockroach. Uh, we use uh, two very important pieces of, uh, of technology here that we built, um, Raft and MVCC. Um, other things that use Raft, oh gosh, Vault uses Raft, etcd uses Raft, lots of distributed systems use Raft. Uh, and, and I've talked about this on architecture talks and whatnot. I, I think, you know, understanding Raft, if you're going to be a modern programmer or anybody in ops or like just understanding Raft is just, I just go out and do it. It's, it's pretty cool. Now I'm going to give you some basics of it. Um, here, but but there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff out there to do. And then MVCC is basically how do you uh, isolate transactions, multi-version concurrency control. And we'll, I'm going to go through a really quick example, the best I can as a marketer, but we'll we'll do good here. So don't laugh at me, Tim. So so Raft is a distributed consensus algorithm. Uh, you may have heard of something called Paxos. Paxos similarly a distributed consensus protocol. I actually it, Paxos is out there, man. It, it was difficult for me to actually understand. I actually had a much easier time understanding Raft, um, but actually coding Raft and making it work for a uh, like a production system, not as easy as you think. Like the protocol seems pretty easy. I, I know Ben Darnell, who's one of our founders, again, probably, I don't know, top five most brilliant engineers I've ever met for sure. 
he's up there with like an own O'Malley or somebody like that. Right. Ben's brilliant. And, um, I think I heard Ben one day say one day, you know, I could probably code raft in an undergrad course in a day, but doing it for a production grade, uh, database has taken me like four years or something. It's like, I forget exactly what it was, but, um, but it, again, it, it, there's a, there's a lot of nuance here. So, um, raft is kind of really consists of two main concepts. There's a thing called a raft group, which is comprised of an odd number of replicas or followers, we'll, we'll call them, right? So three, it's a distributed system. So I'm mean, gonna have three different copies of data, say, or five or seven or whatever that is. Now Raft implements a very chatty protocol. So all of these kind of three pieces are talking to each other all the time. Um, and there's this kind of coalesced heartbeat so that they're all kind of in sync um, talking to each other, right? And so at the core of this, basically, if you think about it, it's just basically three people maybe talking to each other, but they're just in sync all the time. Now, there's this concept of a RAF leader, and the RAF leader is basically elected by the group, and it is in charge, basically, of everything. It coordinates everything that happens. It says, look, it, if I'm going to write to this thing, uh, you know, I'm going to make sure that the followers are all correct all the time. And this is what allows us, ultimately, to, to make sure that these things are, are right in our database. Uh, you know, there's this thing a quorum, right? two of three have to actually commit before I say it's good. So the leader, the raft leader will actually control all that. Um, and it coordinates this. Uh, and, and then only the leader is really allowed to serve this kind of authoritative, up-to-date understanding of what the data is. The raft leader is always going to be right. And the followers may be off a little bit. So you don't want to go to a follower to get the data because it may take different amounts of time for these things to be updated, right? So the core of raft is like, there's a, there's followers, there's a set of replicas, some are followers and one is a raft leader. Now, when it comes to consistency, ultimately what allows us to do is this thing called atomic replication. So in ACID, there is atomicity of a transaction, right? So the, the transaction is the transaction in its completeness. And so the raft leader really ensures that when a transaction happens, it's gonna happen in, in complete at all the followers and myself. And it's gonna make sure that two of three, so I know I'm gonna be right, the RAF leader is always correct, right? Um, and that's a really critical concept, right? Because you don't wanna get halfway done with a transaction and have something else happen, right? Like it's, it's basically you put the semaphores and whatnot in place to make sure that nothing else happens. It provides atomic replication across the followers. This is a key concept. If you think about it from a consistency point of view, think about a distributed system, my little drawing before I had two nodes, it could be five, it could be seven, right? I have these different followers. I'm going to make sure that the data is correct on each one of those things before I actually commit. Okay. And this is really a core, core concept of why, cons why consistency works in CAP. And so you'll hear Raft, you'll hear Paxos. But I think a really key concept to understand. And again, there's lots of stuff out there on the internet about, about Raft. Um, you know, the secret lives of data. If you have never seen this, go check it out. It's pretty awesome. And they have this really wonderful kind of click through and it describes exactly how it works, how leaders are elected, how it gets consensus. Um, um, it's a really nice little graphic tool. So anything you want to jump in there, Tim, or should we move no, on? No, I mean, I think, you know, there, there was a transition that we made there that might have been kind of subtle, but I, I think it's an important one, which is, you know, why is CAP important, right? And why is CAP a thing? Well, what we're really talking about is, um, you know, the extent or how we manage distributed environments, right? Where, you know, you have multiple nodes that can be in lots of different locations, each containing a piece of data that you care about, right? And, the, and so the kinds of choices I'm making about a topology like that is really, you know, the essence of CAP theorem, right? And, and we have made a choice about how our approach, where we favor consistency over availability, we said, but how do we manage that? Like how internally, what are the systems, the algorithms that we use to manage where data lives and how it interacts with each other? How do we maintain That's right. you know, consistency? How do we do transactions? And I think Raft is, is kind of the protocol that we've, we've selected. And we partner actually with the folks at etcd on their implementation of Raft. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's not something that, you know, we just invented, but, you know, Raft becomes a really core concept for us as a distributed database. How do we manage all of these copies of data? How do they, you know, where do they live? How do we keep them consistent, you know, in the scope of a transaction? These are a lot of terms being thrown about here, but it's really important as you begin to spread data out across all of these nodes, you know, all over the world, perhaps, these kinds of things become really, really important 
uh, to not only uh, to have a, a you know a well performing correct database, but really just to understand what's happening as an application right. developer and end user. Yeah, and and again, Raf's going to come back when we talk about in part two of the series and yeah. availability, and it's going to come it's back a- in partition tolerance. Like it is critical and a, yeah. a core piece of all of this. And, and again, we're not spending a lot of time on it. We've done other webinars on this, but you know, you mentioned leaseholder, right? What's a leaseholder? It's that authoritative copy. You know, there are three, there's, there's three ranges, there's three copies. Leaseholder is kind of that authoritative one. And these concepts become really important as we talk about all of the kind of the, um, the guarantees and cap. Yep. And um, if you want to learn more about like leaseholders and all that stuff, Again, our docs is tremendous. I, you know, Jesse and team does such a great job. I, I talk about docs every single time I'm on any sort of live stream. Um, but I think there's a, in particular, there's a section called the life of a transaction uh, in our database. I think it outlines kind of how these, these principles do kind of come together. I say RAF leader on this slide, this is a leaseholder in cockroach DB terms. You know, these, these the, the leader and the followers, uh, that data is actually, those aren't just objects, that's at ranges. Uh, if you want to go check out um, the architecture talk that we have uh, in our YouTube channel, uh, it, it'll get deep into that. It's it's an hour rapid fire Jim talking some architecture, but we get through a lot of stuff. Not Jim two, by the way. Sorry, Jim two. All right, so check this thing out because I think that's it's amazing. Okay, now, okay, so Tim, just don't make fun of me as I do this. Okay, I'm just a marketing guy, um, but kind of the there's raft which is important right because it's going to make sure that like that atomic transaction is going to be done but what happens when two transactions come in at the same time who wins right like that this this like i got a transaction happened in sydney one in new york uh they're trying to hit the same object like how do i order them right that is also a critical component of consistency now on cockroach we implement something called mvcc multi-version concurrency control look i'm going to give you a quick little walk example of this thing now this is just some slides. Uh, if if and I, I mean, way too many caveats here. Um, if you wanted to actually uh, get into this, there's a lot of research on this. But think of this as the I in acid transactions, the isolation level, right? Like, you know, serializable isolation is what we have in Cockroach, you know. But you could have snapshot isolation. You could have, you know, different, you know, read committed, right? So there could be a little bit of overlap, right? This is really what helps us get to serializable isolation, which just basically means like, if four people show up at a at a store. They're going to be serviced in order. You can't have, you know, you know, you can't, you can't have them two working on the same till at the same time. Well, right? and, and before you jump into this, because you've you've kind of let the cat out of the bag with with isolation, right? I mean, it, it's worth it's worth I think perhaps providing an additional bit of context here. I mean, isolation is often something that can be tunable in databases. There are varying levels of isolation, from what's generally kind of considered a relatively weak level of isolation all the way up to the strongest serializable. Cockroach has has chosen to implement serializable isolation and serializable only. Again, this is something that that other databases have different um, you know philosophies about, I suppose. But I think it's important as we talk about isolation to understand that again, just like you as a, an end user, ultimately need to make decisions about about how you view cap. Um, we're making some uh, decisions about how we view isolation, and and we're 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 you know. Uh, we, we've chosen to implement serializable isolation, which is another way of saying that uh, the database really will prevent all sorts of anomalous behavior that can happen in weaker isolation levels. So again, this is something that we feel is strongly important. Um, others may disagree and, and have a different view of the world, but yeah, this is um, this is kind of all the all the all the, the varying views of isolation, which it can be, in itself is a crazy it's a academic crazy discussion. World. It's a crazy, but. I, I, it, it is actually, this is something as a developer, I didn't think about this stuff. Are you kidding me? But no. it actually is a deal now because I, you can, if you think about hacks into systems and that sort of stuff, you can hack things that aren't serializable or linearizable and play with, you know, there, there, there's some really interesting things at, 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 at consistency models. So yeah, I'll say Alvaro this, or it, somebody actually, one of somebody in the audience actually posted this and thank you Alvaro for doing that. Cause I think it's, this is a really great link. Yeah. I, I would say just as I think people who are beginning to use distributed systems may not necessarily be aware of, of where those systems fall in kind of this cap theorem. I, you know, as a longtime user of databases, I, I unfortunately would have to admit that for a long time, I didn't understand isolation levels. I couldn't tell you. And in fact, we've talked to folks all the time who probably don't know or don't understand the isolation level that their database is running in. And I think it's, it's, it's one of those things as you get, you know, deeper into this new world of distributed SQL, you have to understand, you have to understand what isolation is 
and how ultimately important it is to correctness um, and, and all sorts of other things. And again, I think it's one of the nice things about cockroaches. We just kind of take the mystery out of it. We're going to run it's serializable um, isolation, the strongest level, and that's it. Good stuff. And I was such a horrible coder. I hated commenting. Try catch blots. What? Try catch. Oh, come on. Yeah, but that's the stuff that actually is good code. And so you, you, these things become really important over time as you learn more and more. Yep. Again, I, you know, I can't, you know, Jepson does, uh, you know, Kyle does a great job here just outlining what these things are, going through the various different types of databases, talking about it, it gets a little bit, you know, academic and definitely up there intellectual. Um, but but it, it does a really good job. There's there's lots of good resources out here. But, you know, I, I always like to give Kyle uh, some, some. No one would confuse us with intellectuals, Jim. No comment. All right. So, uh, all right, Tim, I'm going to go back to my presentation here. Definitely part of this part. So, okay. So I'm going to give a really quick walkthrough through MVCC. Now this is, this is like the gym version of this. Uh, there's probably like 18 different things that can and go wrong here. I'm not using like calculus to describe this thing, but it's kind of a, a quick understanding. So if we think about a basic flow of a transaction, we have a transaction, we have a timestamp, a TAM stamp could be on say the transaction. And then there's an object and an object is just a row of data, a record, something we want to actually commit, right? And so there's kind of three components here. So let's just say a very basic flow. I have a transaction, it, it has its timestamp of one, and then I have an object and it has basically an MVCC, you have two timestamps. You have a read timestamp and a write timestamp. It's actually really, really important because when you're writing things and you're not in a single system, well, remember I had this raft thing where I had to communicate with these two people in the back end and do all this stuff. That that takes time, right? So while I'm off doing that, like I don't want another transaction to come in and like get a get a half record of this thing. You know what I mean? Like a half a commit or get bad data. So I actually have to understand when the write was done and when the most current read timestamp was done. Right, and so there's two timestamps on each object, which is actually a really critical component of, of MVCC. Now, when I write, I write this thing at 001, I get a new write timestamp, I go off, I do all this raft craziness about getting quorum and all this good stuff, right? Um, I increment it and then the read remains current, I'm in a good state, so the read comes back and I have a read timestamp of three, that's when that everything was committed, everything's great. Now, when I access this, if I have a timestamp that is, greater than three in time, you know, this is incremental time. Think about it as like 1203, 1204, whatever. Um, I'm good, I'm, I, I'm after the most recent read, I'm good, right? So now let's come in and say, now let's say there's a transaction, right? Okay, so same thing as before, I come in, I start writing the object, uh, the write is at 01, I create this temp object. But, but before I'm done with this temp object and this whole raft thing that I'm doing, right? Another transaction comes in and wants to write to that object. Now I have, concurrency issues, right? So now I have this thing coming in at 02. It looks at the, the timestamps. It's obviously the 02 is larger than the timestamps in the object. We can compare them. There's a conflict. I have to deal with this. Try catch block. That thing's going to fail. What am I going to do with that transaction? The database can deal with that. Your code can deal with that. But MVCC is the other side of Raft. Raft making sure all the, the partitions, the, the pieces are all right. MVCC is critical for us basically to get serializable isolation so that we can make sure the data is absolutely correct every single time. And we're gonna actually mitigate this kind of who's accessing the data at the same time. So those two things really is what comes together. Um, and, and long story short, it's like standing in line at a store, you can't complete your checkout transaction until those in front of you had completed your thirst. Um, that's actually like, that is a copy paste from the Wikipedia article that talks about MVCC. Actually, the Wikipedia article is pretty damn good about going through this. Um, this was my quick little play on it with uh, with with some with some visuals. So I hope that was helpful. I, you know, like I said, look at I'm I'm just the marketing guy. Um, this webinar is not <laughs> advanced. It's not. It's intermediate. The concepts are important. Uh, the, the the accuracy of my graphics and my description. I'm just gonna go with I'm the marketing guy. Well, and so, you know, I might just add a little bit more color here only because, you know, we get this question a lot out in the field, uh, folks who are new to cockroach, you know, they, they, the last question is like, you know, do you have locks? Like is, you know, d does right. the system lock, you know, when I, when I'm an update right. or, or a select or, or something like that. And, um, 
And, and of course, in order to, to maintain serializable isolation, oftentimes in early databases, monolithic kind of more traditional databases, that's how you implemented serializable isolation. You would, you would lock a row, right, while it was being read or, or updated. Well, you know, as, as systems have advanced and um, concurrency and throughput become, you know, more and more important and systems become distributed and all the kind of things that we're used to talking about, you know, this kind of lock-based approach, locking an entire row became kind of, you know, it, it just not uh, not scalable in, in right. some way, shape, or form. And so MVC is really an alternative to that, right? So what is MVC in, in addition to everything you said? It's really about instead of updating a record in place, like locking a record and updating it in place, it's this ability to, to write or append multiple values for the same piece of data. And, and essentially the system is able to determine which is the correct piece of data um, based on timestamps, which you mentioned and, and accurately showed. So timestamps become like a really critical piece of the equation when talking about MVCC. Instead of just you know, brute force locking and overwriting the record, we maintain multiple copies of, of the record over time and understanding um, and being able to order those updates based on accurate time is something that we do. So we kind of avoid the traditional or locking in the very traditional sense um, Which Tim, I mean, mean ultimately, to... from a database design point of view as well, you aren't just updating a record with a new timestamp. You're basically appending, which Correct. then provides even further value in that I can actually, you know, select data at a certain time, and you know, you can have these almost like time machine requests of data. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which really and there's cool. some, you know, and I know by the way, there's some really neat things that you can do then. And I know again, we're probably well off topic, but hey, well, that's okay. What's a webinar without veering a little bit off topic? Um, you know, MV, having MVCC storing multiple values um, that, uh, you know, consistent values over time allow you to do some interesting things, time travel queries being one of them, yeah. um, garbage collection, some other things that, that are kind of interesting uh, benefits of that approach. Yeah. And then, you know, the time, so time is really important here. The timestamp is really important. Uh, people ask us difference between Spanner and Cockroach. Um, mm -hmm. Spanner does re re rely on uh, an atomic clock. The, Google has actually gone as far as actually having hardware that syncs these things up to guarantee this sort of stuff. Cockroach, we haven't, we don't use hardware so that we can actually run anywhere. That's the kind of the big difference. Um, and then we use basically like, a, I think it's like network time for NTP and then like a logical drift. We have stuff in there. So um, we've done a lot of work in actually this. Actually, one of the most popular blog posts we have on our website is dealing without atomic life without atomic clocks. Life without atomic clocks. A yeah. great article. Great, or great, great blog great post. Article, so yeah. So yeah, really good read to understand our kind of view of, of atomic clocks, time yeah. stamps, and the like. Very important. Yeah. So there were two questions about that that just came up actually. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. And so it is yeah. So how far off can this you get? How do it, we don't need to answer that right now, but I think Check out that article. Um, it, it does go into good. It's actually yep. that thing was super popular on um, on the Hacker News as well. Thank you, Nicholas, for for posting that into the chat. I hope everybody can see that. So uh, there was one actually question here, Tim, and and hmm. you know I, we get this we get this conversation a lot, and I have my answer. I'd love to answer your answer. You know what type of workloads or products would be okay for going consistency? Uh, you know, for something else, is it you know is like logging, banking, you know. What is it about the workload? So, so why is consistency important? Like what workloads yeah. is that yeah, good yeah. for? What kind of, you know, what, what kind of workloads would be okay where I don't need to be like super great consistent like this, right? Like well, I'm looking at a CP versus AP. Geez. So, all right. So I see the question. You know, I have an opinion, right? Um, I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm sure an opinionated do. person. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, and, and I'll talk about it from a cockroach perspective. Um, cockroach is a, a transactional OLTP engine. And, and, you know, while isolation is something that you can tune and, and you know, perhaps, you know, the cap theorem allows you to, to look at things a little differently. You know, the kind of workloads that, that, that we are very well suited for is where correctness and consistency are important. And, and there are some obvious, you know, obvious use cases where correctness and consistency are uh, of the utmost importance. Inventory management, banking, payment, you know, where, look, if, I, you know, if I'm depositing or withdrawing money from my bank account, I don't want to you know, leave it up to chance that network contention or network partition perhaps you know, gives me more or less money in my account, right? So, so correctness is something that we just see as, as, as incredibly critical to 
to OLTP or transactional workloads. Right. I think oftentimes people assume that they can get away with easing these restrictions. Um, I think that's oftentimes not really the case. And I think it's born more out of folks not actually having a good handle on what happens when things or to the extent to which things can be corrupted in your database. Right. I, and I may not be explaining it well, but I think what I'm saying is I think more often and not correctness and consistency are the right answer than they are the wrong answer for right. OLTP type workloads. But I, it is somewhat yeah. startling at times when people say, well, I don't really care. Uh, I, I think you probably do. Yeah, and it, it's a range and it really comes down to understanding what that data is and what the workload is. And mm -hmm. and often, you know, like Jim, Jim Hatcher kind of commented in the chat, Tim, it's, you know, sometimes when you get back into higher level summaries of stuff, actually it does matter, right? And so it may not be that individual piece of data, but there's some other thing that's happening here. And we get this all the time and you know, people want to, use Cockroach as a system of record for say customer data where they're pulling data from lots of different places. You know, I was an MDM for master data management a long time, like makes sense, right? And so I, it, it's really, there's trade-offs. And again, I think understanding cap and, and remember by the way, P is actually pretty important in these things because you got to evaluate if something is even a distributed system. You know, if you are not partition tolerant for writes but you are for reads, is that a, is that a distributed database at that point? Right. You know what I mean? And so like you got to you got to start thinking about writes and reads, you know, a single a single write bottleneck is not, you know, going to cause you problems, too. What happens when that thing goes down? That's not partition tolerant. Right. That That's going to mess with availability. You might get good consistency from a write point of view. But you know, so there's there's lots of different it's the right tool for the right job. Um, I think Cockroach is great for all types of workloads because I think the the simplicity of the operational complexity of you know reducing scale and all that. All the other stuff, but then again, I work here. I'm a bit of a homer, so. All right, uh, last thing. Um, so Raft and MC, MVCC are definitely part of this. So Tim, you talk a fair amount about this. Uh, yeah. We're gonna talk about this in probably part three. When I talk about partition tolerance and, and latencies, we'll come into that conversation as well. But you, you, you often think about distance, right? survivability of yeah, it's, it's almost I think almost more survivability so look you know constraint triangles of which or trade-off triangles you know of which cap theorem certainly is are really actually kind of important I mean you can find these really everywhere I think to some extent in life right um, and so oftentimes we 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 have one that we talk about um, and we treat it a little differently than maybe the cap theorem I mean you know we, we've talked about kind of it, it, ad nauseum what what cap theorem is so let's just assume that you know we, we are going to be consistent in the face of network uh, partitioning or network um, or, you know, something bad happening, right? Uh, but when you begin to distribute data all around um, your cluster, uh, you know, you have to make some choices or can make some choices. And for us, it's not really about selecting performance or survivability. It's really, it's really uh, understanding the difference between those two, the topologies that, that lean in one direction or the other and really adjusting your deployment of, in this case, Cockroach uh, to, to fit your needs. And so, uh, you know, what's a good example of this? So what do I mean? Well, what I mean is, you know, if I want to be, if performance is the absolute most critical thing to me, right? Well, then maybe I stuff all of the nodes for a Cockroach cluster inside a single region or a single availability zone right. so that there isn't a whole lot of um, you know, network communication required between nodes. That's a perfectly acceptable deployment of Cockroach, right? But what am I sacrificing when I do that? Well, I'm sacrificing survivability. I'm now, I, I'm now not tolerant to the loss of that region or that availability zone because everything that I own sits in that one place, right? But yeah. it would be enormously performant. So I'm giving up some of the survivability characteristics. Meanwhile, you know, you could build a, a system where I had a single node deployed in, you know, this vast numbers of, of regions, et cetera, et cetera. You could build kind of this, this very survive, very resilient architecture that might not perform as well, you know, given, given your implementation. And so I think the trick about, about deploying a cockroach cluster, at least, is really understanding what your goals are. And it's okay, actually, to have goals of both of these. You know, I want to be, hey, I want to be performant and survivable. That's okay, too. But I think it's really understanding you know, understanding your requirements, understanding the nature of, of this distributed system um, and, and finding kind of where an appropriate place to be between survivability and performance. 
And that's oftentimes, I know it says distance because that's part of it ultimately. Yeah. Uh, but this is, you know, we're not, we're not sacrificing consistency here. We're always going to be consistent, but do you want to be consistent and fast or consistent and resilient? Right. And I think and, uh, you- that's an interesting thing we spend a lot of time talking about a lot tim and i think it's you know and, and that comes back to topologies and multi-region and and there's a lot of stuff if you guys check out again in our docs if you look at topology patterns we talk a lot about these sort of kind of trade-offs it's a it's funny funny when you when you used to implement a database you just think about the logical model but in a distributed world you got to think about the physical location like the physical model of that data which I kind of always come back to is my kind of, you know, my lowest common denominator for these conversations. Where does that stuff live and what is important to you? Do you want to survive or do you want it fast? <laughs> and, and that, that is, that's the trade-off and it, and mm-hmm. it, I mean, it's, it's a bar on the bottom. So, it, you know, I think everybody has it, good, fast and cheap, I think is the normal one that we always Yeah. Have. That was trying to think of it in real time and yeah. I couldn't, so yeah. I didn't go there, but yes, that's it. So again, and it, this is just another way of saying, see, you know, the challenge to consistency, well, the, the speed of light, uh, you know, y'all like, you know, I always think of what's the ultimate competitor of cockroach It's the speed of light that that's what we that's I, our engineering team thinks about that all, all the time. So, all right. So um, one other thing is I actually somebody asked in the in the QA. I love this question. Is the name cockroach because of our survivability? Yes, actually, uh, it was kind of the database you couldn't kill. Uh, I think Spencer and Peter both have a little bit of a dark humor. Uh, when they were in college together, they they started an open source project called uh, GIMP, which is a uh, image manipulation tool. I think you all, my, many know of it. They wrote that at, while they were at Berkeley together. Uh, so they've been open source people for like, named it GIMP. Um, you know, I, I, I wanna say that they had a name in, a hand in naming Colossus, but that's another, hmm. I don't know. I gotta ask Spencer that sometime. So, um, so that is everything. I, I did wanna wrap up. I know we only have about two minutes. Um, any, any parting words before, we, we, before I kind of do this, this wrap up, Tim? No, I don't know what you could say in the wrap up. And I just think it's really important to understand cap theorem. Uh, it's under, it's important to, to understand the, the guarantees that we've discussed. It's important to understand where cockroach fits on that from my perspective, but um, you know, it, and it's also important to understand where others do too and, and what those trade-offs are. Yeah. Whether or not I mean, we effectively communicated that today, I'm not entirely sure, but uh, Tim, it's you and I, dude. I mean, you know I mean hey. but, but like I said though, if, if we at least pointed you in the direction of some really worthwhile material that you can read, a baseline understanding so you could start to ask the right questions, then I have, I'm so happy that I, I have accomplished that because I think, you know, to me, understanding these concepts, like as a marketer, do I get it fully, deeply? Have I coded it? No. Do I understand some of the concepts? It's helped me understand things like etcd. It's helped me understand things like Kubernetes. It's helped me understand Cockroach, right? And so you hear about these things, getting to the core of the, of the core principles the core building blocks that make these things work, I think is just really, really important. And so I agree. And I, and I think just, just, yeah, you know, those three things to me are like, you know, it's cap, but you know, further reading is, is all the things we mentioned yep. MBCC. It's important to understand what that is. Um, so raft super important right. and, and then isolation. And we'll do more of this. Uh, I want to wrap up. I get like one minute. We have two more parts. Tim, come on. We have two more parts. I could see you, you know. We have two more parts in this. Uh, May 12th, we're going to talk about availability. And then June 16th, we'll talk about partition um, tolerance. So I look forward to those sessions as well. Um, The follow-up email will be sent. Um, JP does a great job of doing this. And we're going to try to put a lot of the links that we had in here and there. Um, But there is a survey. This has been a bit of a different event and, and, and session that we've had. We tried to take a little bit more academic approach. I hope it was useful for everybody. But again please, by all means, give us feedback because we do want to make these things uh, better and better every time. We, we definitely take uh, all the feedback into careful consideration in gory detail every single time. Um, so, so please do that. Um, and then if you want to get started with Cockroach right now, I've got to get my last commercial. Go start on Cockroach Cloud today. Um, you know, we've built, a, I think, a really killer database. And this is a really easy way to get started. We actually have a free tier as well um, that we're building out. Um, so a uh, always free version of Cockroach DB that you can actually build apps against today. So uh, with that, uh, I want to thank you, Tim, for, for this, um, for jumping in and, and Jim Hatcher and Michael Goddard in the back end answering questions. Thanks guys. I really, really appreciate it. Um, but I thank everybody here for taking time out of their, their day. This is a, you know, taking an hour is a lot. I get it. Um, but I hope I, I hope we provided uh, value um, during this hour. So thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thanks buddy. All right, man. We'll